Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, interesting symposium. And I want to congratulate uh, Eunice and the colleagues here for um, organizing it. And I also want to congratulate the college, uh, colleagues in the various colleges and faculties for uh, engaging purposefully with the two documents. I thought that your reports were excellent, thoughtful, considered, um, and uh, have made a real contribution to uh, this important issue. So my congratulations and my thanks. I want to begin with a story which acts as a metaphor. When I first went to Rhodes University 40 years ago, in the central facade of Rhodes University, which is a Herbert Baker building, uh, there was a very small office which was the vice chancellor's office. And the rest of the building uh, was made up of the classics department, the history department, the English department, the philosoph uh, philosophy department. Theology was in there, Afrikaans was in there, and uh, the whole building, except for the vice chancellor's office, which let me say again was very small, was occupied by the humanities. Today, that building is occupied by the vice chancellor's office, which has grown, the Human Resources Department of the University, which is large. Uh, this is something, this is, uh, I'm not saying something that I wouldn't say in front of the Vice Chancellor of Rhodes University, and I have said this in front of him. Uh, the Human Resources Department, which is large. The University's uh, uh, Finance Department. The Economics Department of, the Teaching Department of Economics of the University. The Accounting Department of the University. So what does the metaphor tell us? The metaphor tells us that I think 40 years ago, the humanities were at the center of the university and were at the center of the university project. In the 1980s in this country, the debates around the future of the universities were certainly in the humanities. It was proposals from the humanities that made the biggest changes in South African universities throughout the 1980s. The admission of black students, the rise of academic support. I'm not a great friend of academic support, but the rise of academic support. All of these things came through the humanities. And indeed, this idea of the humanities being at the center of the university was repeated by the American educationalist Sheila Slaughter, who said in the 1980s that the humanities were the center of the university in the United States too, that all the big changes in the humanities were made, uh, were, all the big changes in the universities came out of the, out of the humanities. And much of that, I think, goes back to the events of 1968 and the student revolt. But today, as the Deputy Vice-Chancellor has said, we're seeking solutions. We seem to have lost our place we seem to have lost our traction. We seem to have lost our purpose. We've lost everything. So it seems. Uh, for the last two days, I've been driving through the Karoo, which is one of my favorite parts of this country. And as I was driving through, I stopped at a little uh, place and picked up this book. It's called Karoo Keepsakes. And it's full of a little nostalgia about the Karoo, nice little things and characters which pop up in the Karoo and things to see. And I began to think about it, and I said, actually, this too is a metaphor. So people look at the humanities as they might look at the Karoo. It's nice. It's interesting. There are a few little keepsakes. Let's you know, keep a little bit of poetry. Let's keep a little bit of languages. Let's look at a little bit of history. That's what the Karoo is for. If you really want interest in the Karoo, look at fracking, eh? That will get you going at the Karoo. That will get you excited. And in a sense, this metaphor is the metaphor for the humanities too. Look at a part of the humanities which has changed irrevocably from when I was a student over a 40-year period, the teaching of economics, completely changed because of its, of, its, uh, of its deep practical importance and the rise and the power of mathematics inside, uh, inside economics. When I did economics, one had to do a course called Economic History, which was a fascinating course because it dealt with Marxism and the rise of liberal thought and these kind of issues. Today, economists leave the university without any understanding of economic history at all. And as they say, that tells the whole story. 
Part of this debate about the humanities has been uh, reduced, I think, and that's the correct word. It's been reduced to a, an exchange between the rise of neoliberalism and the rise of managerialism inside the universities. And all of us experience both of these issues. In that kind of world, the humanities are certainly, are certainly um, second class or second order disciplines or have become second order disciplines. But if we think about it, and the Deputy Vice-Chancellor touched on it, if we think about it, it's not a problem of the humanities. It really is a problem of what is the university for? And that is a debate which we also have to have. Is the university essentially about education or is the university about the professionalization of people to get jobs? Now, I don't want to say that having a job is not an important thing, but it tells us something about the times in which we live that there is this impetus, this, this necessity to get a job. So in many ways we face uh, primarily a disjuncture between, on the one hand, our historical understanding of this and this contemporary meta-narrative which makes the job so important. We are told in many ways, we are told in many ways that the important thing is to educate our children to get jobs. And if you forgive me, Mr. Chairman, I want to tell a little story about my child. Uh, when she was in matric, I wrote a piece for Business Day in which I said in the Business Day, I confess, I'm sorry, my child is going to university and I've told her to study the humanities. She will not get a job and I've told her she'll not get a job. But I've told her to go there and expand her mind and I can't wait for the first day she comes home to have an argument with me. What happened? I have never received messages back from people which were so encouraging about this piece that I wrote. People saying, fantastic, at last people are talking up for the humanities. At last people are saying why they matter. One man wrote to me, he was a trader on the, in one of these banks, and he said to me, I'm sending this to my sister because I studied economics and I'm bored as anything in this job and I wish I'd studied philosophy. So my point here is that there is a sense, a community, a, a, a society out there. Of course, this is, not a, this is not an academic sample, but there is a society out there that is interested in the humanities. And here is an, here, here is an important point. It seems to me that what has happened is that science, particularly applied science, has captured the imagination. And if you want to see an example of this, look at the famous SKA that South Africa has just been awarded. I read the other day somewhere that there are a group of kids in classrooms who have little poetry and little sessions around the importance of the SKA. This is actually extremely interesting. This is mobilization inside classrooms around the importance of applied science. One of the things we might think of doing is how to bring back the message of the importance of the humanities into the classroom. We know from the ASEF report, uh, from uh, teachers telling us again and again that gifted kids in history, gifted kids in English and Afrikaans, their parents come in and say to them, no more English and Afrikaans or history for these kids, extra maths and accounting lessons. So there is a sense in which we have to go out there in many ways and fight what I would say the good fight. There is a deeper question underlying this, and I just ask you just to think about this question. One of the crises that the Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor raised is perhaps the result of the fact that we brought the humanities into the universities because aren't the humanities in many ways living outside the universities? And the example of this is to look at the rise of festivals in this country. Arts festivals, Afrikaans festivals, Opikopi, all of these things suggest in a way that the humanities outside the universities are living a very full and interesting life. And the best example of this, or an interesting example of this, is to look at the way the Afrikaans language and Afrikaans cultural production has exploded in the post-apartheid period. There's an enormous explosion. There's not a crisis outside, but there may well be a crisis inside the university. 
One of the complications is the specifics of South Africa and indeed our own history. Our use of knowledge, the use of knowledge of the humanities in the past has been directed at specific ideological goals. And I think that is something that we should deal with in great compassion and pain and understanding that the humanities were complicit in a, in a certain structure of society. And that our, one of our responsibilities is to assist in the breaking of that particular uh, world view. Let me come to the reports that I've been asked to talk about. And I'll touch on them only fragmentarily because I was really have been involved in this project right from the beginning. Before I do come to the reports, I just want to say one thing. It seems to me that the conversation about the future of the humanities in this country is much richer now than it was four or five years ago when we started this process. More people are talking about it. If we hadn't started the conversation, I fear that we would have just wallowed in a situation uh, increasingly getting weaker and weaker and weaker without a possibility of defending our own position. So it's absolutely critical that we've had these, uh, these two inquiries, these two reports. The ASIF uh, project was started in uh, 2007 uh, on the ASIF Council. It was to look at the future of the humanities. It was to write a consensus study. There is a certain methodology in the consensus study. It was to seek ways in which uh, we could understand what was going on in the humanities and drive the humanities forward as much as we could. It's an effort, and ASIF is an organization which attempts to influence public policy. It has no court of, uh, uh, it has no legislature, uh, legislative or political uh, leverage inside the system. And the project was headed uh, by Jonathan Jansen and myself. We got together a uh, group of people and we met over a, a period of time. We had funding from, um, from uh, uh, ASIF and from uh, the Oppenheimer Trust and the Ford Foundation. Well, the report is there for people to read. The one issue that I would raise about the report, because it's, uh, it's a, there's a paradoxical relationship between this and the consensus study, Paradoxically, the ASIF report is what one might call an insider report. By insider, I mean it has framed its recommendations with inside South Africa's existing science system. It doesn't look beyond South Africa's existing science system. Indeed, there was no brief for us to look beyond South Africa's existing science system. So its recommendations, and in a minute I'm going to touch on the similarities between the two reports, its recommendations are, are framed within that science system. Um, there are one or two quite interesting little bits in the report, and I'll just mention one which I think is important, is that the deprecation or devaluation of the importance of the academic book uh, has become a, a crucial issue. Our performance is measured as, uh, essentially on the same model as science. And as you know, the science system is uh, short papers or papers inside academic, uh, inside uh, 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 accountable academic uh, publications. And we are measured on the same system. As a result, the book, which is considered or traditionally being considered as the weighty contribution of, uh, of uh, people in the humanities and social science has been deprecated. One of our recommendations was to not only change the counting around that, but to give a much higher profile to the book. To say that the book has an essential role, it has a public role. Uh, Sharmil Jeppe's uh, name should be uh, in the Sunday Times alongside the Alan Payton Award by writing a big book. Or uh, indeed, Shireen Hassam's name should also be there uh, writing a book because academic books matter. And that was our point. Let me, let me come to the charter document and just correct one thing that, the, that Professor Satati said. The ASIF report set out first. We were, the, we were the first people to set out. There was a long period of gestation. The uh, charter document was, uh, came out of the Department of uh, Education uh, and Training. It was uh, 
uh, a product of the thinking of the minister, Blade in Zimondi. I think it came out of an interview that I did with him in the Mail and Guardian on the future of the humanities just after he became, I think that sparked, I mean, I don't know this for, for uh, certain, but I think that got it going. The Charter Humanities, and this is the difference between insider and outsider, the Charter Humanities went much wider. It saw a role for the humanities outside of the confines of South Africa's science system. And so its, uh, its recommendations are highly ambitious, sometimes controversial, and uh, several people have said that it's actually an anti-humanities uh, document. I think that that's a, an, an overrunning of the judgment of it, but I think we should certainly take both of the documents seriously. Uh, what the Charter does is propose a new direction, a new direction in the way that we uh, research the humanities. Its epistemological goals are different from the traditional epistemological goals that we've had in the humanities. It's much more of an emancipatory document. Um, and uh, I and, uh, and, uh, and Sharma Jeppi were on that group too. It was an interesting dynamic group. Their methodology was somewhat different from what we had done in the, in the, um, in the, uh, in the ASIF report. Uh, and, so the doc and so the two documents are before you and before us for, for, for discussion. My own preferred view is that there should be some meeting of the two documents, uh, and in a second I'll touch on that. But just to complicate your lives a little bit more, there is a third document. The Department of Science and Technology have a, uh, what they call the fifth grand challenge, uh, and they, their idea is to roll out a fifth grand challenge in the humanities and social sciences. So when you begin to think about these things, you must also include the uh, document of the Department of Science and Technology, which was done within their methodology inside the Department of Science and Technology. So let me um, just talk about the uh, bridges between the two reports, the ASIF and the uh, firstly, there is a need to stay, uh, there's a need to address the state of the humanities in South Africa. There is agreement that if not a crisis, that certainly something should be done about the humanities. And as Professor Satati said, this is not a uniquely South African conversation. This is a conversation which is happening right across the world. Secondly, there's a need to, dis uh, to address systematic disorder in the humanities. And part of that disorder is if we get a situation where, um, for example, African languages has crumbled in this country. I mean, this is a, this is a huge uh, blow, not only to the country, but to our political project uh, and, a, and a huge blow to the humanities themselves. There's a need for the formation of a body of some kind in the humanities. We need to have a body which champions the humanities in the Charter report, it's very ambitious. In the ASIF report, it's less ambitious, but some sort of a body. There's a need to address the funding allocation for the humanities. We need somehow to improve funding towards the humanities from all directions, from the NRF right through to um, the amount of money which we're given for graduates. There's a need for a white paper on the humanities. I mean, it strikes me that if you can have a white paper on a range of other things, we should be able to have a white paper, to write a white paper on the importance of the humanities and to stress that. There are opportunities for, co for cohesion in implementing both of the recommendations. So if you look at the two documents side by side, you can say, well, there are things we can do here and things we can do there. We need to promote, uh, we, we certainly need to promote excellence and the nurturing of a research culture in the humanities in South Africa, and I guess everybody in this room would agree on that. So these are the overlaps between the documents. There are, of course, many differences. I think that we're at the beginning of a conversation about these issues. I think it's crucial that we, and I go back to what I said at the opening, that people at UNISA have uh, uh, taken the issue seriously. We need to discuss these things because some of this might end up in legislation. And one of the worst things we know is to try and undo legislation once it happens. So we must speak loudly, loudly. our voices must be loud, um, because as we said at the beginning, uh, this is too important to be left to the politicians. 
I want to end, if I can, with uh, something from Injibula and Debeli, because I think that this goes to the heart of the importance of the humanities in South Africa. In this extraordinary little book, uh, Fine Lines from the Box, Further Thoughts About Our Country, Injibula and Debeli writes the following. The, the interactivity of our new binary relationship is a humanizing space of immense complexity. It is a space brimming with risk-taking, trust, suspicion, intrigue, transparency, obfuscation, real and imaginary boundaries, negotiation and imposition, honesty and dishonesty, concealment, discovery, alignment, realignments, shifting identities and the pains and horrors of lapses, loyalties, betrayals, idealism, greed, courage, doubts, certitudes, redeeming truths, and insights leading to optimism and progress, an excitement of infinite possibilities. If the humanities don't chart those, I fear what will happen to us. So thank you very much.